Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Welcome uh, to our live stream once again today. Uh, you may see a, a new face in our, in our group today. Uh, my mother decided to, uh, to join us today. So thank you, Mom, for joining us. And uh, Marielle and myself and my mother will be uh, singing uh, a few songs for you this morning. When Tyson, my son, your pastor, was, I don't know, maybe fourth grade or so, we were driving home from school and I said, son, what is your favorite song? And immediately he said, he's able. <laughs> I don't know if that's still his favorite song, but we're going to sing it. Please join with us. Everybody should know, he's able, he's able. cheer us by the way. In a little while, we're going home. Something that uh, I believe all of us are looking forward to. What a day that will be uh, when we all get to heaven. Oh 
rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Hallelujah. Our final song this morning is In His Time. And truly, uh, in all things, we have been um, we're really at, at the mercy of God's, uh, God's timing. And what we've been learning uh, week after week through this series, uh, or the series we just finished, um, is that we need to be putting our trust and our faith in the one who is trustworthy and faithful. And in his time, he will make all things right. And that is what we look forward to. That is what we cling to. So sing this song with us. Uh, enjoy it in his time. On this quiet street in Madrid, Spain, you can hear the inviting sound of worship. The music is coming from this building, where the Alcala de Henares Adventist Church meets. Today is a special Sabbath. Some members came to church early to decorate the stage. They're preparing for a special program to celebrate and appreciate the women of this church. It's a bit hard to imagine this small space filled with a hundred people, but as the program is about to start, people come in one by one. Before you know it, the place is so full, some members even have to stand at the back. Five years ago, this church started with only three families. Now, around a hundred people come every Sabbath. Most of that growth is because of their young people. Ha sido un proceso the number of young people attending grew very fast. We started with only seven young people, but we dedicated our time to youth ministries. Last year, eight members were baptized, and another six accepted Christ this year. The youth gather in this small room to study the Bible. The bond among them is evident as they sing praises together and study God's Word. 
We try to be united and be a big family. And of course, we're very thankful that the whole church always keeps us in their prayers. This group finds ways to meet for any occasion throughout the week, not just on Sabbath. This has helped the young people grow closer. They're not afraid to talk about their lives and share their hopes for the future, but they make sure to have fun too. They even started their own youth choir. But as much as young people are welcome in this church, it has presented them with a problem. We have a problem economic very grande. We have a financial problem in the church because almost half of us are young people without income. So we don't have enough money to keep renting this place of worship. This group is praying for God's plan for their congregation. They want to keep growing, and there's no denying the importance of the youth in the church. As youth leader, Oliver is encouraged by what he sees and experiences with the young people. It warms my heart seeing all these young people come to church. Sometimes we go to church on Friday and stay as long as we can until about 11 p.m. On Sabbath, we go to church and stay there the whole day, enjoying worship together. I feel very good when I see this, and it helps me grow spiritually as well. Please pray for the Alcala de Henares Church as they continue to reach out to the young people and everyone in their community. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome once again uh, right here to uh, our studio and uh, to church. Uh, we're hoping to be able to uh, resume services in person soon. It's in the works, and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to being able to see many of you again face-to-face. Uh, -face. And uh, as, as the country slowly begins to reopen, and our communities slowly begin to reopen, and our churches slowly begin to reopen, and we develop plans for how to do that safely, um, we are excited uh, to be able to gather together once again. But in the meantime, uh, here we are once again, and today we are starting a brand new series. Uh, we have wrapped up uh, the words of Jesus. Uh, now, I still will be referencing them some, but uh, uh, that series is done. Ten whole sermons, ten whole weeks of being quarantined in our homes and um, and worshiping from our living rooms um, and now we are continuing on so this is week 11 technically and uh, we will be uh, we will be uh, starting this series on um, which i have entitled almost home uh, and there's many different reasons for that um, hopefully uh, as the light is at the end of the tunnel um, and we're able to return uh, to church soon. Um, almost home has some significance, um, but there's a deeper meaning as well, uh, a much more spiritual meaning as well, and we're going to get into that in a little bit uh, with our sermon for today uh, and in the next couple of weeks as well, as we anticipate still having to worship at home for another week or two uh, or longer. We'll, we'll see how that all goes. Um, but uh, we do have a few prayer requests today, and I'd like to share those with you so that you can be praying for each other. And uh, some of you are already aware of some of these uh, requests um, because they get emailed out or they get put on Facebook and things like that. But um, the first one uh, actually comes from Tim. Tim is asking for a prayer for himself. Uh, Tim from the Fergus Falls Church, and um, he uh, ended up in the hospital this week uh, with a bad infection in his foot. And um, I went to visit him there. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't able to have many visitors, only one at a time and certain hours for visiting. But I'm really grateful that they were allow, uh, allowing visitors in. And uh, so I was able to go and visit him in Fargo. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, they were uh, needing to amputate his little pinky toe on his foot. And um, I have not yet heard how that's, uh, how that's going. And um, I'll have to, have to reach out to him again today. But um, 
he was really optimistic, but continued to be praying for Tim as he heals um, and as he tries to literally uh, get back on his feet soon. And we also want to pray uh, for um, Greg. Uh, Greg is a friend of Glenn. Glenn sent in this prayer request. Um, and Greg has been experiencing some very severe back pain. And so we just prayed um, and lift up Greg today, asking for uh, God to give him relief from that back pain. And our third and final prayer request for this, this morning is, uh, was sent in by Judy. Uh, Judy asks for prayer for her friend Llewellyn, who is having um, some troubles with healing uh, after a cancer diagnosis and uh, having colon surgery and having to go through radiation and chemotherapy and it's it's been a year on and it's just been a, a long battle and uh, so lord uh, we, we were just praying that the lord would uh, bring healing and relief and comfort uh, to Llewellyn and his family as well so uh, without any further ado let's uh, let's pray uh, for these requests and pray for the holy spirit to be with us today father god uh, we thank you so much uh, for the privilege and the blessing to be able to gather once again here today. And Lord, we know that there's a lot of things going on all around us. And in, even in our own personal lives, there are people who are struggling and who are dealing with mm, serious health problems and, and other issues as well. And so today, Lord, we, we pray for Tim, we pray for Greg, and we pray for uh, Llewellyn. Uh, all three of these men are uh, dealing with um, various complications and issues with their health and their well-being. And so, Lord, we just pray for healing. We pray that you would uh, strengthen them, be with their families, help them to be a strong support as well. And be with the friends who sent in these prayer requests. May they be a continued support and be able to show the love of Jesus uh, during this time. And now, Lord, as we uh, dive into our message for today, uh, beginning a new series, may your spirit dwell here in this place. Uh, fill us with your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, here we go. Uh, this brand new series, Almost Home. Today's uh, title for this message is, Are We There Yet? Are We There Yet? And I'm going to, uh, maybe some of you have uh, heard that question before. Uh, we're going to get to that in a little bit. Uh, but I want to begin today um, uh, telling you about a man named Troy Larson. Uh, Troy Larson is a uh, self-described author, uh, photographer, and uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek, gentleman adventurer from Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, Larson travels around the state of North Dakota and explores and photographs and documents ghost towns. Uh, towns that were once occupied and bustling during a, a bygone era of North Dakota's history. Uh, Larson maintains a, a, a fascinating blog online uh, where he writes about his adventures and, and posts eerie photographs of abandoned farms, and post offices, uh, churches, schools, and, and main streets across North Dakota. Uh, the name of his website is appropriately named uh, ghostsofnorthdakota.com. Uh, and this week I was reading uh, one of his blog posts uh, entitled uh, Road Trip, uh, Ghost Towns and Vanishing Places Along State Highway 200. Uh, kind of a long title, but this post caught my eye. It caught my attention because the Kaler family farm where, you know, my dad's side of the, my whole, my, the whole side of my family, my dad's side, <laughs> uh, calls home and, and grew up, uh, is only situated four miles uh, off of Highway 200. And Highway 200 stretches all the way across North Dakota, um, 400 miles or so, um, from Halstead, Minnesota, uh, to Fairview, Montana, and beyond. Um, it's a it's, it's a big, long highway out in the middle of nowhere, and it goes through all these tiny little towns. And I remember, I remember as a kid uh, driving through small towns on Highway 200, 200 such as, uh, such as Hertz, Hertzfield, right, where, where my grandpa Clifford would often uh, head to whenever he needed parts from the implement dealer or it, he was overdue for a haircut from the local barber there. Uh, I remember heading up to the farm for a week uh, in the summer uh, at times, and... Uh, 
we would go up there so that we could attend vacation Bible school at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in McCluskey. Uh, and I remember the times, um, driving many times, uh, driving uh, right into Goodrich, uh, which is where the farm was most closely situated. Uh, Goodrich, North Dakota, as grandma would say, uh, driving into town, right? Uh, to, to buy a few groceries at super value or, or make a deposit at the bank. Uh, get a bite to eat at the cafe, uh, and of course, you could never go to town without uh, stopping by the elevator just to see who was in and chat with the other farmers who were in town, uh, just to catch up on the news, right? Uh, but many of those businesses, many of those, uh, even those towns along Highway 200 are but a memory. Um, Troy Larson featured um, several ghost towns and other notable landmarks along 200, Highway 200, in, in the blog post that I read. Uh, one, one landmark, though, that, that kind of stood out to me uh, was the James River Church. Uh, this little Lutheran church, um, out really in the middle of nowhere, out in the country, uh, reminds me of a church that I pastored, actually, when I began my ministry um, outside of Artichoke, Minnesota. A, a simple white rectangular building with a prominent steeple uh, perched on a hill, of course, uh, overlooking uh, sprawling rolling hills and fields and, uh, and pothole sloughs all over the place. Larson noted that the church uh, and the accompanying uh, cemetery right on the property, uh, located just 16 miles east of Carrington, um, were well maintained and clearly somebody was uh, taking good care of the property. Uh, but evidence suggests that no one uses that building anymore, right? It's a, uh, it's a quaint little country church, uh, but it's no longer in use. Uh, the windows are all boarded up, uh, the doors are locked tight, uh, and there's a little sign outside uh, that tells a uh, very brief history uh, of the church, founded in 1919, and ultimately it closed in 1969. The James River Church, and literally hundreds like it, uh, they remind, remind me of the temporary nature of life on this earth. Uh, many of the things and, and the places of our past history are now gone. Right? It, it seems that the only constant in life is the end of it. But regardless of the, the, more, the, the normalcy, uh, inevitability of, of death and endings, they still feel unnatural, right? If we've learned anything um, during this time, these last few weeks uh, from this novel coronavirus, it is that many things about life in this world, right, are unnatural. It feels like this world is not even our home, right? As a matter of fact, the Bible, the Bible tells us as much in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 34. I'll put, the, put it on the screen. I'm going to be quoting from the, the New Living Translation today for this verse. It says this, For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. You see, during Jesus' ministry here on earth, right, he, he taught many things to his disciples and his followers. And he also shared about things to come. And he promised a brighter future for those who believe. One such promise is found in John's account of the life of Christ. We've, we've spent a lot of time in the book of John over the last several weeks. Um, I, I love the gospel of John. And the story goes like this. Jesus is speaking privately with 11 of his closest disciples. And knowing that he was soon to be betrayed and executed, he told them, little children, I'll put it on the screen here for you. It's in, it's in John 13, 34. He says this, little children, let a little, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. But you see, they didn't understand what Jesus meant by this. They, their minds just weren't grasping the fact that he was soon to be turned over and 
ultimately executed, crucified for the things that he was saying and doing. So one of Jesus' most outspoken disciples, Peter, right? We've encountered Peter before. He spoke up and he, he asked this, Lord, where are you going? <laughs> and to this, Jesus responded, uh, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Now, that's an interesting little promise there, right? You will follow me afterward. So it's not saying that we can never be together, but you will follow me afterward. Obviously, a little put off by this, Peter interjected again, right? He says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? Why? I'll lay down my life for you. He's really zealous, right? He's just really excited about, um, and he's maybe a little offended that Jesus would even suggest um, that Peter wouldn't follow him or couldn't be with him. In other words, he believed, right, that there was nothing that could prevent him from following Jesus wherever he went. But Jesus foresaw what was about to happen. And he asked this question, and this is in John 13, 38, as the story continues, right? Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly. And it, it kind of sounds a little uh, sarcastic, you know, a little, uh, will you really lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. So basically, between now and tomorrow morning, when the rooster crows, you're going you're gonna to reject me three times. And the story uh, goes on and he, he does. Uh, Peter does uh, reject Jesus. And it was a very uh, devastating time for his in his life. Um, ultimately, thankfully, he repented of that and uh, he became one of the, the strongest disciples um, that helped build the Christian church. But ultimately, um, Peter and all the rest of the disciples, they gave in to fear. They gave in to anxiety. When, when Jesus was arrested in the garden, <clears throat> they were there and then they were not. They took off. And really, their, their own lives and their own freedom um, were more important to them than sticking close to Jesus. So my question is really, how much harder is it for you and I today to succumb to, to fear and discouragement in the face of hardship and uncertainty? I mean, if it was hard for the disciples, how much harder is it for us now when we can't even see Jesus face to face? But Peter and the rest of the disciples, they were not left without a, a promise and a hope in the face of hardship and uncertainty. In John 14, verse 1, the, the story really is continuing uh, from the end of chapter 13, and, and it just goes right on into chapter 14. Jesus continues speaking, and he says this. Man, this is one of the best um, promises Jesus uh, ever gives. This is very comforting words. He says this, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, for a follower of Jesus, there is a tremendous peace that fills the heart, knowing that Jesus, who is true and faithful, has promised to return and take us home. Truly, truly this world is not our home. With all of its sickness and pain and heartache and death, this is not our home. Our time here is temporary. Know that, believe that, trust what the word of God says, that our time here is temporary. This world is not our home. The one who has never failed to keep a promise is assuring us that we are almost home. You know, when I was a kid, uh, I had a bad habit of asking my dad, um, are we there yet? Anytime that we drove anywhere, right? Uh, if any of you have ever been kids, 
which is all of you. Um, you may be asked that of your parents uh, or parents out there or grandparents out there. You have kids or grandkids that have asked this, this same question. It's kind of age old and it never ends or dies, does it? Uh, if we were going into town, uh, are we there yet? Um, it would be my question. Uh, if we were on our way home, are we there yet? Uh, would still be my question. Uh, if we were going to grandma's house, are we there yet? Uh, much more excited to get there, right? Uh, but without fail, uh, I would pester my dad until he gave me an answer, right? And my dad, being a, a typical dad, uh, he never gave me a straight answer. He would always give me something kind of quirky. Um, almost every time I asked, are we there yet? He wouldn't miss a beat. And he'd say, we're here, but we're not there. And man, it's such a dadism, right? What a, what a dad thing to say. And I'm sure, unfortunately, I'll instinctively uh, say the same thing to my own children someday. Uh, we're here, but we're not there. Uh, but man, it, this isn't just a witty reply uh, to be silly. Uh, it's actually very true about the current situation that we find ourselves in, right? As believers in Jesus, Christians look forward to his return with great anticipation, right? Uh, we long for God to, to put an end to suffering and to sin once and for all. We look for the day when, when God will take us to heaven and fulfill his promise in Revelation 21. And I'll, I'll put the words on the screen here. Revelation 21 verses 3, 4, and 5 says this, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Wow. This promise has given many, many people a renewed sense of hope for the future. But what are we supposed to do while we wait? Well, 1 John 3, 2 says this, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. So even though nobody likes to wait for things, sometimes it's necessary or unavoidable. And in this case, it's both, right? When it comes to the return of Jesus, just like the song we sang this morning, it is in his time in his time. And when we ask God, are we there yet? And he responds, we're here, but we're not there. What are we supposed to do with that? Because really that is where, where we find ourselves. We're here, but we're not there. When I was a kid, and my dad would say that to me, right? We're here, but we're not there. I had no choice but to find something better to do, right? Than to just sit there and wait. So I would look out the car window and count how many Volkswagen Beetles I could see who, uh, when they passed by or sitting in parking lots. Uh, or I'd play I Spy. Or more often than not, I would, I'd fall asleep. And the trip would seem to go by much quicker that way, right? Um, but is sleeping an option for us now as we wait for the soon return of Jesus? Well, I will be sharing more about this next week. Uh, I can't fit it all into one sermon, um, but it will suffice to say right now that God has so much more in mind for us here and, and now than many of us recognize. We're not being called to put our faith and trust in Jesus, which is what we've been preaching about for the last 10 weeks, and simply sit back and wait for the clouds to part, you know, sipping on a glass of tea, right? Because we know that Jesus is returning soon, because he promised he would, right? He also expects his followers to be actively preparing for this event, preparing the world for this event. Not just preparing our own hearts, but preparing others. That starts with believing it ourselves. Do we truly 
believe, truly, honestly, wholeheartedly? Are we believing the promises of Jesus and refusing to give in to fear and despair when everything around us seems like it's never going to get better? I haven't been... I haven't been too keen to preach directly on COVID-19 or the last days written of in the Bible. This is because many people, um, they first need to be introduced to Jesus and fall in love with him for themselves. Otherwise, some messages, even messages from the Bible, uh, may be received with fear, doubt, and skepticism. That's why, for the last 10 weeks, as we've been talking, um, we've been unpacking the words of Jesus and discovering hope and faith and comfort during this very, very stressful time in modern history. And if you want to go back and watch those sermons, if, if you're just catching us today for the first time, if you're in the middle of um, discovering our, our online sermons, uh, go back and start with number one. Uh, Watch the series on the words of Jesus. Find hope and comfort and see the true heart of Jesus. Fall in love with him. And then pick up right where you left off with us here today. It will all make so much more sense. But here's the thing. It's, it's impossible to preach Jesus without also proclaiming his imminent return and sharing that blessed hope with the world. It, it's impossible. That's part of the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If you have a saving relationship with Jesus, hearing that he is coming soon and we're going to be reunited with him is the best news ever. No matter how hard life is going to get, no matter how difficult things may, may progress, in this old world, having that hope is good news. Having that hope allows us to get through each day. And it's not just a coping mechanism for dealing with stressful events. It's an opportunity for us to truly partner with Jesus and believe that his promises are true. Friends, we have nothing to fear. Or, or fret about when good things come to an end and it seems like nothing will ever be as it was. We have nothing to fear or fret about. When an old country church closes or a small town cafe shutters its doors and windows or a life is cut short, we can cling to the promises of Jesus. Today, I'm going to leave you with these promises of Jesus directly from the Bible. Here's the first one. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, Jesus says in John 14, 18. I will come again and take you to myself in John 14, verse 3. I will make all things new, Revelation 21, verse 5. And one of my favorites, behold, I am coming soon, Revelation 22 and verse 12. Is it your desire today to see Jesus soon. Would you like to see Jesus? Are you ready to put this old world behind you and head home? Say a prayer in your own heart today as we pray together and renew our hope in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, today we surrender our lives to you. We so look forward, we long for the day when we will be able to see you again face to face. We anticipate with great longing your soon return when, when you will put an end to all the sin and suffering in this world um, and death will be a thing of the past and, and illness and disease will be a thing of the past. Sadness and tears and pain will all be things of the past. 
and we can look forward to a future, a brighter future with you. Lord, we long for that day. Come soon. Lord, help us in the meantime to know what to do to prepare our, not only ourselves, but others for that coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us once again today for our live stream service. We hope that you join us again next week. And I hope that you've been blessed uh, by the message that we receive from the Lord today. If you have been blessed and you're feeling like you'd like to find a way to give back to God somehow for the way that he's been working in your life, uh, we'd like to give you the opportunity uh, to give an offering or return your tithes to God. You can go to Adventist Giving online, and there you can have the options to return your tithes and offerings to God. If you don't have that option or, or feel comfortable putting uh, your financial information online, even though the site is secure, uh, feel free. You can mail a check uh, to your church treasurer or uh, even here to our church directly. We hope that you can join us again next week for another message from the Word of God. Be blessed and take care.